Number 155, Clarence Earl Gideon Petitioner versus H.G. Cochran. We'll hear argument first this morning at number 86-1278, Hustler Magazine and Larry C. Flint versus Jerry Falwell. The issue before the court is the admission and the evidence of the defendant's confession. The standard of review is the NOVA, by which I mean it respects the jury's findings of historical fact. Goldberg's gone. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Ruth. <laughs> Supreme Court podcast. Today's topic is going to be something near and dear to my heart. And honestly, it wasn't an episode that I was planning on making, but um, I was in a federal trial. In fact, you'll notice that the last podcast, the audio was pretty spotty because I was out in a hotel room trying to do the best to record the podcast that I could. But um, I was out in a trial in Covington, Kentucky great place to be, very friendly people, quaint town. If you haven't been there, I absolutely advise taking a trip out there. It's right across the river from Cincinnati. But as soon as you cross that river, you just jump right into, you know, small town, Kentucky. You've got brownstone houses. You've got very friendly people that smile and wave a very fantastic hotel. The Covington uh, hotel uh, just had a glorious stay for the three to four weeks that I was there. And the courthouse staff was incredibly accommodating and very kind and led to some very wonderful conversation and a few new people to meet, which I'm always excited to do. That's actually one of the reasons why I really enjoy trying cases uh, all over the country. Um, It's hard on the family, requires a lot of time away. Uh, But the one thing it gives back to me is the ability to see how justice operates all throughout the country. I've been into federal district court in Houston, Texas, and, uh, and in Honolulu, Hawaii, Um, obviously Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Miami, all over the country. They do it differently. Uh, They do their best version of justice. And um, this was certainly one of those cases where um, a court seemed to be very efficiently operating with very friendly staff. And it was a joy to uh, try my client's case in that courtroom. But, you know, the reason why... um, I decided to move forward and just address the opiate epidemic today is because there was a, uh, a case that I, I defended uh, on behalf of a interventional anesthesiologist named Kendall Hansen. And this isn't the first inter- interventional anesthesiologist I've represented. Dr. David Lewis, we got him acquitted. Um, Dr. Leslie Pompey, um, a man that I just absolutely love and adore and who handled his uh, case um, just in, in such an amazing way, um, both interventional anesthesiologists and both a joy to represent. But this one was a bit different for me uh, because, you know, I knew those other two, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Pompey, for a long time. Um, got to know their families, spent a lot of time with them. Um, this one, I, I didn't have the case for as long. Um, and uh, it, there wasn't the sort of detailed investigation that we would normally see. And so I really didn't get a sense of the clinic other than, you know, what was on paper and what we were able to determine. And, and, you know, during the course of this podcast, I'm not going to give any, you know, privileged information or conversations with my client. That stuff is all sacred. Uh, but I can tell you the public facts that came out at that trial. And um, the reason why this case was very important to me is because when you actually lay all of these facts out, it's very hard to see how anybody believed that a crime could have been committed. Uh, that's that's just the strangest thing. So uh, here's the plan. The first thing I'm going to do is talk a bit about the federal law. For those who are not familiar with this at all, the federal law related to opiate prescribing and how that can become a crime under uh, the scheme created in the Controlled Substances Act. I'm going to talk about the development of that law, where it came from, why it is the way it is. I'm going to bring you all the way through the history from the early 1900s all the way through to modern day and a most recent case, Ruan versus United States, which was heard at the Supreme Court, and a few other cases that I have that were up at the Supreme Court level. And then I'm going to talk about the facts of this case and how the law has changed, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, and really impacted the delivery of healthcare 
in the United States. I'll go over all of the important decisions. And I think by the end of this, even though this will be probably a longer episode, longer than I've done before, we were at about 55 minutes for most of these episodes. I think we're probably going to go much longer. My hope is that by the end of it, you will have a better knowledge than most on issues related to the delivery of healthcare, the prescribing of opiates. Um, I, I imagine that there are a lot of pain patients out there who may be wondering, why didn't the pharmacy fill my prescription? Uh, why did my doctor not treat me this way? Why did I get treated differently when the CDC guidelines came out? Uh, my hope is to answer each and every one of those questions. Um, I will tell you that I spend most of my day dealing with this particular regulatory scheme. And if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to just um, hit me up on the website, ronaldwchapman.com. Uh, leave a comment. Um, certainly write a review if you can for the uh, podcast, just so they know that you're out there and people are listening and people care about the things that we're doing. But I'm going to try to educate you all and provide this information uh, to each and every one of you out there and hopefully to the people that you could share it with so that everybody can really understand one big problem that is occurring in our country related to the delivery of healthcare and why it doesn't seem that we have a near fix. And I'll also discuss what we can do. So with that, let's start with the first part of this and go through the development of the drug laws. And for this, we are going to have to go back to the 19th and 20th centuries. Just like most things, drug control policy was largely a revenue measure in order to capture revenue for the federal government. Here, it was to capture revenue for the extensive Chinese uh, opium trade. The government at this time noticed the growing problem of addiction due to the high availability of opium products. And so they enacted um, a Tariff Act of 1832 that was designed to curb addiction, and it was designed to curb it in a way that we see the federal government often do, and that is to tax something so that it becomes a bit more expensive. The concept is that if people are addicted to it and it becomes more expensive, then they're going to have the difficult choice of the food on the table or the addiction. Uh, We know how that ended up working out, but back then this was a common measure in order to try to... um, prevent people from engaging in a certain habit. So opium wasn't initially taxed as part of the law. The law came out in 1832, but in 1842, opium was placed on the tariff list at a tax of 75 cents per pound. Uh, Back then, 75 cents, a fair amount of money um, per pound, a pound of opiates, a pound of opium um, is a massive amount. Um, But opium use at that time became so popular that the hope was that that large tax would get handed down and increase the cost of this. Um, Unfortunately, that didn't really work out. Opiate use continued to be more popular. Subsequent amendments to the Tariff Act of 1832 increased taxes on opium until it was taxed at an astonishing rate of 80% of its value by by 1862. And so during the late 19th century, the national appetite for opium continued to grow. Chemists began making uh, medicines heavily laced with opium, morphine, cocaine. Some of you may have heard that Coca-Cola in its original formulation had cocaine in it, but there were a whole bunch of products on the market that you didn't need a prescription for back in the mid to late 1800s. And they all had opium and different versions of it as well as some versions of cocaine. And of course, unsurprisingly, a lot of people began to be addicted to these products. This is nothing new. So the federal response to this rising amount of addiction was relatively swift. But other than taxing, the only thing they really could do was focus on labeling restrictions in order to increase consumer information, just like the FDA may want to label something on uh, on a box. They would do the same thing with opiates as well. And they increase labeling requirements, resulting in the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. That made it unlawful to sell a mixture containing opium, cocaine, or other substances if the label didn't clearly indicate the presence of a listed substance. 
Additional controls during the early 20th century came in the form of uh, import and export controls in order to stem the flow. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying right now that Chinese fentanyl is getting out of control. Uh, there's a lot of overdose deaths that are resulting from it. This is exactly what was happening back then. Of course, from what we can tell, the overdose death numbers aren't nearly as high. And I think that's probably an issue related to purity. But the addiction numbers were relatively high. So we had that Pure Food and Drug Act of, of 1906. Um, then in 1914, we had the first substantial step towards what's called a closed system of distribution of narcotics. And uh, that was the Harrison Nar Narcotics Act of, of 1914. Under the Harrison Narcotics Act, a physician must issue a prescription for these substances that contain opium, cocaine, morphine, these types of what we would later call scheduled drugs. You needed a physician prescription. And this is where we first see these three words pop up that have been a big part of my career and a big part of the case of any doctor accused of overprescribing. This was the first instance in which a physician could only prescribe a medication for a legitimate medical purpose. It was still only a revenue measure, the Harrison Narcotics Tax, tax Act. And it made it illegal to distribute without a tax stamp, which really only cost a dollar per year. But it went further and required that distributors register with the IRS collector. We had no DEA back then. And the IRS was involved in a lot of enforcement of these types of acts. And so a doctor or a dispenser, a pharmacist would have to register with the IRS and keep meticulous records of drug transfers. So this started that idea of a closed system of distribution. If you had those meticulous records and the IRS wanted to see if you'd fully paid your tax, then they would be able to look at everybody that you distributed a drug to. And if you were avoiding your tax, then you could be um, you know, charged for a violation of the tax code. And, and the act also required a written order which must be kept by the distributor. This is the first instance of a prescription being required, a prescription a written order by a doctor that was then given to a dispenser as part of their records. And that was a prescription. So the act also contained a specific exemption where an order was issued by a physician um, in the course of professional practice. That's the next part of the phrase that is going to be very important for any physician prescribing a controlled substance moving forward. So just to recap, we have the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act of 1914, the first instance in which we have to have a prescription and the first instance in which a, a dispenser, a pharmacy must keep valid records related to the distribution of these types of listed drugs or what we would call listed chemicals now. Of course, it wouldn't be the law without somebody violating it, right? So we have Dr. Jin Fei Moy, one of the first cases in which the Supreme Court was asked to determine the applicability of the Harrison Tax Act to a physician's practice. Uh, Dr. Moy was indicted for engaging in a conspiracy with a guy named Willie Martin to distribute morphine sulfate. Morphine sulfate is a, is a common compound. That's really the morphine that we talk about that maybe a pain patient these days may be prescribed in order to alleviate their pain. It's a bit of a longer acting type substance. It's got a longer half-life. Um, it takes a little while to be eliminated from the body. And so it can cause a bit of an increase in overdose risk, but it's a relatively cheap and expensive controlled substance and has been used for a very long time in order to alleviate pain. Well, Mr. Martin, that, that's Willie Martin, the guy who was working with uh, Dr. Moy, was not registered with the local uh, internal revenue collector as required by the act. And so he was only really supposed to receive the morphine sulfate pursuant to a written prescription. Despite that, Dr. Moy decided to issue prescriptions to Mr. Martin. And those prescriptions were, according to the government, not written in good faith. 
and they were not written for a medical purpose, but really they were just designed to supply Mr. Martin with drugs to feed his addiction. And so the government is taking a stance here in this case that the prescriptions were not for a medical purpose. And what is not a medical purpose is simply feeding someone's addiction by continuing to prescribe them controlled substances. Remember, the intent behind the act in IRS tax measure was designed to curb addiction by requiring a closed system of distribution, records, and also taxation. Strange thing about that is nothing criminalized specifically providing these medications to somebody for the purpose of uh, addiction. Um, There was only uh, a prohibition on prescribing without a valid medical purpose. So there would have to be a determination as to whether or not addiction was considered a medical purpose. Um, Given that Mr. Martin was not registered under the act, um, he wouldn't have been able to receive like wholesale amounts of medication. That's the distinguish, distinguishing factor there. And so the court heard the case, went to trial, and the court reasoned on appeal that the act was created pursuant to a treaty, and it was pursuant to the government's spending power, and it did not apply generally to the public, but rather only to those that the act sought to regulate. Very interesting ruling. The court declined to give the act the power of a general police measure because it was enacted as a revenue act. And and basically what that means in plain English is that this act could not be enforced generally against the public. So Mr. Martin was immune from the reach of the act or violation of the act because this really was only supposed to apply to dispensers of drugs. Martin wasn't dispensing, he was using. And there was no part of the act that criminalized the ultimate end user or really said the requirements of the ultimate end user. I suppose if they went after Dr. Moy for prescribing outside the course, that may have been a bit of a better case, but they didn't do that. They decided to go after Mr. Martin, and that appears to be a miss by the prosecution. So doctors one, DOJ zero, that's the score up on the board right now. Of course, it sounds like Dr. Moy was doing something that no current doctor uh, would, would really even think of doing. I mean, there were no physical examinations. It was just basically Dr. Moy acting as a pharmacy. So then we get to United States versus Doremus. Doremus was the next case that that came up. He was indicted for providing heroin to an individual, not in the usual course of professional practice, but because the individual was a dope fiend. Now, you might say heroin, wow, that, that's an unlawful um, drug. It's a Schedule One. Schedule One has no legitimate medical purpose and is unlawful. Back in those days, it was not. There was actually a version of heroin, and in fact, I think it's still used today very, very sparingly, but it carries the same name, and it has a very similar chemical compound, but it's not what you would consider street heroin. It's not. It doesn't really share the relation, just like street fentanyl is much different from the fentanyl that you might find at a doctor's office or at a pharmacy. And so the district court following the Dr. Moy case declared that the act was not a proper revenue measure and was an invasion of the police power, which is reserved to the states. This has come up recently, and it's a concept called stare decisis. This has come up recently um, in a lot of heavy Supreme Court fights, including the abortion uh, decisions. Stare decisis says that you've really got to follow what higher courts have done and what your court has done, absent some very specific circumstances, and there's a test. So the district court in this case, in the Doremus case, had absolutely no authority to overturn the Moy case because they are a lower court. The Supreme Court is a higher court. The district court in this case was a lower court. So ultimately, the Doremus case gets all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court disagreed with the lower court and held that the act can't be declared unconstitutional simply because it accomplishes another purpose other than raising revenue. The effect was sweeping. As a result of the Doremus decision, the Supreme Court had effectively given Congress the authority to supplant any contrary state law and impose a nationwide blanket prohibition on the sale of narcotics to be enforced with incredibly severe criminal penalties. And also gave the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, gave the Department of Justice for the first time the ability to determine what is considered in the regular course 
of the professional practice of medicine. The day that decision was announced, the practice of healthcare changed drastically. The Department of Justice had a seat at the table and could now declare what was considered the professional practice of medicine, even if the states didn't object to the healthcare that was delivered. Shortly after that, the Doremus decision, Webb versus the United States was argued. This is another physician case. And the Supreme Court was now asked to dive into the murky waters of, okay, now that you've said the Department of Justice can go after things that aren't the practice of medicine, what is the practice of medicine? That was the question before the court. And, and what does this statute specifically criminalize? Dr. Webb was a properly registered practicing physician who worked in close proximity with a retail pharmacist. His name was Goldblum. This all occurred in Memphis. And Dr. Webb prescribed morphine for addicts with, without an examination and solely for the purpose of treating addiction. Now, strangely enough, Dr. Webb ultimately, spoiler alert, goes to jail for all of this. And the funny thing about that is actually it's not so funny. It's sad. This guy was doing exactly what a common methadone clinic would do today. Now, the reason why a methadone clinic is allowed is because the federal government gave us permission to have that as a new measure to try to curb addiction. But absent the federal government's authority through the Substances and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, you're not allowed to do it. And Dr. Webb did it. And so he was ultimately convicted and ultimately thrown into a early 20th century jail as a result of something that is essentially legal now if you get the proper approval. So Webb would prescribe for these addicts without examination. And when I say addicts, he was literally prescribing to people who claimed an addiction to the medication and was not uh, pretending at all to provide medical treatment. Uh, they had to pay a necessary office visit of 50 cents. That was a decent amount of money back then. Imagine your copay today is probably a little bit more than that. And he claimed that he would prescribe morphine in a way that would tend to cure or break the addiction. That's interesting. So the idea was if you prescribe enough morphine to somebody, they won't become addicted, probably because their cravings would be satisfied. And he claimed that that was medical treatment. I think that that was probably a relatively cute, convenient argument after the fact, after his hand was caught in the cookie jar. But that's what he claimed. He claimed it was part of medical treatment. So Mr. Goldblum, Goldbaum, was the pharmacist who worked near Dr. Webb. And he filled 30 times as much morphine as brought by the average pharmacy in Memphis. Um, this is interesting because this is the, the first case that I could personally find when I was looking to see when the DOJ was using statistics related to other pharmacies for the purposes of prosecuting a specific pharmacy. Um, that, was, that was very interesting to me because back then everything was on paper. This was a very, very old case and they didn't have the ability to create an Excel spreadsheet and run the data. So with little fanfare, the Supreme Court declared that to consider such an order specifically for an addict, a prescription would be a plain perversion of the meaning of the word prescription and that no discussion of the subject is required. So Webb goes to jail. Don't pass go. Don't collect 200. Go to jail. You're running a methadone clinic effectively before they became lawful and you're prosecuted. So they are saying for the first time simply prescribing to an addict addiction treatment, the practice of what we now call today addiction medicine, where drugs like Suboxone are approved, is unlawful back then, and you must be prosecuted. Six years later, we get to Linder versus United States. Now we're talking 1925. The Supreme Court took a bit of a step back in the Linder case and clawed back some of the power provided to Congress in its previous Harrison Act decisions. Mind you, this is all before the DEA is ever created. IRS is still enforcing the statutory scheme. Justice McReynolds, joined by eight colleagues, wrote in that opinion, I won't go too deep into the facts here, but the justices wrote, obviously direct control of medical practice is in the state's. It is beyond the power of the federal government. 
incidental regulation of such practice by Congress through a taxing act cannot extend to matters plainly inappropriate and unnecessary to resemble enforcement of a revenue measure. Plain English, that means Congress is recognizing that they shouldn't dive too far into the practice of medicine. So it seems like in the Linder case, the DOJ pushes a little further into some other territory. And the court said, we're not comfortable going that far. The court noted that the act says nothing of addicts and does not undertake to prescribe methods for what constitutes medical treatment. And the opinion stated the court can't conclude that a physician acted appropriately simply for prescribing to an addict. And I think what really happened here is a few years go by, addiction spirals a little further out of control. The current tax approach to this is not acting as an effective deterrent. Some doctors need to be out there treating some of this addiction. And I don't think the court wanted to put itself into the place of deciding what is considered medical practice. And I think there were probably some states that were getting a bit annoyed that their populations have to deal with addiction and the doctors don't have any way to treat it because they're scared. I'm going to do a bit of fast forwarding here. Because the cases don't really change that much between 1925 and the 1960s. 1960s, let's get this into context. Think all along the Watchtower, Jimi Hendrix, Vietnam War. Getting out of the 50s, a booming era post-World War II. Jumping into the 60s, we've got drug use. We had the Korean War for a bit earlier in the 50s, and then we just go headlong into Vietnam. And we also go headlong into Richard Nixon's War on Drugs initiative. This was a major platform during the 1970s election. It was to stem drug abuse and drug crime in the United States. I think Nixon sort of set up a paper tiger, and we're all very familiar of a lot of the You could probably now call it propaganda out related to drugs and drug abuse and the rhetoric that suggested that certain drugs were going to make people crazy or psychotic. You know, we saw psilocybin um, talked about around this time and criminalized. We saw marijuana the same way and these drugs were, were, were villainized and then ultimately listed in schedule one by the DEA that was the um, result of Nixon's policies. So as a result of um, Nixon's election and the sweeping election, he saw it as a, as a powerful mandate from the electorate. He won every state but, but Massachusetts in the 1972 election. Um, he saw it as a mandate that he needed to do something about, about drug laws. So the Controlled Substances Act was, was passed originally in 1970 as the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. And and really, I mentioned the 1972 election because, um, you know, ultimately his efforts in curbing drug abuse seemed to resonate with uh, the base. We had a lot of uh, post-war folks. We had a lot of conservative, um, uh, a largely religious voting base. And, you know, we had certainly a progressive movement of hippies and whatnot, but it didn't really constitute enough of the electorate to really make a difference in any sort of, um, you know, free rights or free choice movement uh, supporting drug use. So it it just really didn't take long until there was sweeping change with uh, drug laws. And some would say that in, in some cases, those drug laws may have been considered uh, racially motivated. That's, a, I think, a different discussion for a different day with people who know more about that than I do. But certainly, there are voices um, in this mix that would suggest that uh, this was to control certain populations and uh, increase the ability to prosecute and jail uh, folks related to drug activity. And I am not going to argue at all with uh, with that position, but I will stick mostly to opiates in the practice of medicine uh, for the topic uh, here. 
And if anybody wants to hear about those issues, we can explore some Supreme Court cases perhaps in a, a later episode to talk a bit about the impact of those drug laws on things like crack. And we can talk about crack retro amendments and all of that. There's some very interesting things to learn about in that space. Well, let's get to the first Post Controlled Substances Act case. This one is a doozy. So, Dr. Moore. Funny thing about Dr. Moore is he's a guy who doesn't learn his lesson. Dr. Moore was originally charged prior to the Controlled Substances Act. Um, he testified at his own grand jury proceeding, which is something I have never actually seen. Usually when you receive a grand jury target letter, you lawyer up, you take the Fifth Amendment, you don't testify before the grand jury. If you have a business, you get uh, attorneys for your employees and other people so that they can be properly represented. And, you know, you hope that a grand jury doesn't come back with an indictment and simultaneously you investigate your case to try to prepare for trial. But that's not at all what Dr. Moore decided to do. He must have been a bit of a quirky guy. He shows up at the grand jury and decides to give a speech about what he was doing in his medical practice. And the grand jury surprisingly believed him. I don't know if this guy had friends on the grand jury, if he had stature in the community. I, I've, I've looked as much as I can into Moore's background, and I do not understand who this person is. But he was able to escape uh, indictment. So the Controlled Substances Act is passed. And he gets charged again because he didn't change his ways. He didn't take the hint. He didn't do any sort of drug testing for his patients. He didn't record the dosages that he was prescribing. He previously agreed to take certain steps to modify his practice. He didn't carry on with those and really didn't take any effort to show that he was practicing medicine. One of the most troubling issues with the Dr. Moore case is that he charged for the amount of narcotics dispensed instead of charging for his medical services, which if you're a physician out there and you happen to be charging based on the amount that you prescribe as opposed to for the visit itself, if you have a different charge, that is something I am not going to be able to help you with. Um, in every single case, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly defend a doctor because everybody deserves a defense, but in every single case where I've seen a varying amount charged based on the amount of opiates received, I will tell you a jury will come back nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10 for a straight conviction on that fact alone. So in Dr. Moore's case, a patient would pay $100 for 50 tablets of methadone, 200 for 100 tablets of methadone. And this was in like $1975, so that was a pretty hefty price. And according to the prosecution, Dr. Moore was by all means a drug dealer. He wasn't doing any legitimate medical services, and it didn't take very long for a jury to convict him. The Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia reversed the conviction based on a pretty novel argument made by the attorney that Dr. Moore ultimately decided to get. Thankfully, he didn't uh, go at it alone this time. And the argument goes something like this. The Controlled Substances Act deals with regulating physicians. And I am a physician. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. But there's this separate scheme other than the drug distribution penalty inside of the Controlled Substances Act that says if you're a registered person and you dispense controlled substances then you should be subject to this other type of penalty. It indicates that dispensers, doctors, pharmacists are authorized to dispense by the statute. And if they violate that authorization, there are other provisions other than the drug trafficking laws that would apply to that doctor. And so because Moore was charged under the traditional drug trafficking law, that's 21 USC 841, for those people who care about the statute numbers, the argument was that Moore couldn't be convicted under this because he was a doctor. So his punishment would go under some other scheme. It's sort of like this. If Congress got really tired of police officer shootings and they decided to make a separate crime that's something other than murder, which was maybe um, reckless discharge of a firearm, and under that scheme, it was a 
10 year statutory maximum sort of understanding that police are required to make difficult decisions. And when those decisions cross a line, there can be punishment that may be as short of murder. That would sort of be like what happened here. Only this statutory scheme is a bit more of a misdemeanor, no jail time regulatory violation. And so Moore thought that he should be only prosecuted under the regulatory violation, not the drug trafficking crime, not the same thing that Johnny Depp's character from the movie Blow would um, would be charged under. So for this, we need to get into what the Controlled Substances Act really says. Um, 21 U.S.C. 841 imposes the most strict penalties on drug traffickers. It is a potential maximum of 20 years. 842 is primarily aimed at technical violations and contemplates sort of a civil penalty, but does afford a criminal penalty punishable for up to a year where violations are done knowingly. So that's a bit more of a misdemeanor type offense. 843 contains additional regulatory provisions, but provides more severe sanctions than 842. I won't get into too much about what those are, uh, because 842 is really what we would be concerned about here. Regardless, Moore's argument was rejected. The Court of Appeals bought it at first and overturned Moore's conviction. But the Supreme Court, when they got the case, they said no. And here's the first case under the Controlled Substances Act where a doctor was successfully prosecuted for prescribing in a way that violated the Controlled Substances Act. The court essentially said that if a doctor acts as a drug trafficker, and prescribes without any medical justification, he can be prosecuted under 841. That was the 20-year statutory maximum offense, and not 842. The government in this case was asked at oral argument whether there are some violations of a registration that could not be prosecuted under 841, but must be prosecuted under 842. And, you know, Justice Potter Stewart uh, I've, I've quoted this section of oral argument quite extensively, and I think it's really important because he, he offered a prophetic question, and, and some of you may get chills even hearing this today because I, I think he predicted successfully exactly what would happen if his court decided to delve into the territory that they, they ultimately did. And here's what Justice Potter Stewart ultimately said. And I'm going to read word for word this quote because I think it's very, very important. I might even be able to find it in the oral argument, and perhaps I will clip it in right here where I'm going to read the quote so that you can hear Justice Potter Stewart in his own words. He says, and is it not true that historically most, if not all, of the great breakthroughs and advances in medical science are made by people who did not follow the conventional way of doing things. They followed a new way, their way. And most of the conventional physicians of their day would have disagreed with them because this is not the way it has always been done. It bothers me that this kind of evidence is the basis for criminal liability. This man was a physician. He was not a fraud. Chilling words from Justice Potter Stewart because he correctly predicted if you listen to that last passage closely, and feel free to rewind if you need to hear it again, he correctly predicted that if we start determining that doctors are guilty of federal criminal offenses because they are following an unconventional way, and he didn't say this, but this is what he means, then the art of the practice of medicine goes out the window when it comes to pain control. And the only thing that would be permitted are those incremental shifts in the practice of medicine where a physician could receive enough support from those who've been there before to justify prescribing decisions. What impact does this have on the practice of pain management? Nothing new, nothing novel, nothing inventive, no new approaches, no alternative approaches, nothing strange. It also suggests that some sort of standard for how a patient should be treated should be created. And who should create it? Well, the federal government later will see tried to fill that void. The problem that Justice Potter Stewart was articulating here 
is that if physicians start going to jail for what he would consider a professional disagreement because a practice isn't generally accepted, we're really just going to end up in a stagnant practice of medicine with no real development because everybody is too afraid to do something different for fear of criminal liability. That is the end result of what Justice Potter Stewart predicted post United States versus Moore. And he ended up being absolutely right. The thousands and thousands of pain patients that I hear from constantly, the thousands of pain patients that I've heard denied prescriptions at a pharmacy because of quote unquote red flags or cut off by their physician because of the implementation of the CDC guidelines are all victims of what Justice Potter Stewart back in 1975 in the United States versus Moore predicted would happen. To make matters worse, the only things that can fill this vacuum were prescriptions that were authorized by the federal government and addiction treatment that was offer, authorized by the federal government, Suboxone treatment. Some people are on it and have some effect, but because this is the only thing that was specifically authorized by the federal government. It's the only show in town. There's nothing new for you as a pain management patient who may have suffered from addiction or somebody who wants to receive that, that sort of care. I'm, I'm going to get off the soapbox a bit because I think there are better voices in that arena. Uh, and I'll, I'll just focus on the law. But um, Justice Potter Stewart had one additional parting shot. And he said the world would still be considered flat if Galileo had to get permission from the government to declare the earth round. That's profound. He's speaking specifically to the practice of medicine and its flaws and its lack of understanding. And he's speaking specifically to the need for development in this area in order for the growth of humanity and the improvement of the human condition. Well, unfortunately, Justice Potter Stewart did not get his way. But the strange thing is, in this case, Justice Potter Stewart was in the majority. It's just that his words have become so misunderstood over time that the conditions that he put on the decision in the United States versus Moore have not been respected. The, the phrase that is most important that has been left by the wayside in post more cases is that if a physician becomes a large-scale drug pusher, they can be guilty of violating the Controlled Substances Act, something I absolutely agree with. If a doctor becomes a drug pusher, they are no less guilty than any other drug pusher. But what the words of the United States versus Moore decision were supposed to stand for was the concept that short of that, you don't get to criminalize the delivery of health care. The court was trying to make a defining line, a demarcation zone between what is the legitimate practice of medicine and what is acting like a drug trafficker, drug pusher. And so Dr. Moore released as a result of the DC circuit court opinion goes back to jail as a result of the Supreme court's decision, because Dr. Moore wasn't doing anything that according to the court looked like the practice of medicine. He wasn't prescribing for a legitimate medical purpose in the usual course of professional practice. Post Moore, we saw a whole bunch of cases go up to the circuit courts that's between the trial court and the Supreme Court. There's 12 circuits, the DC circuit being one of them, and then there's first through 11th circuit. And each one of those circuits started to split kind of deeply on what would be considered the legitimate medical purpose, what the Moore decision meant, and courts started to give their own tests for how this should be used. The Fourth Circuit had one way called outside the bounds of professional practice. Uh, the Eleventh Circuit had another way. In the Sixth Circuit, this idea of good faith started popping up. 
we started to see all of these changes amongst the circuits. And when I showed up on the scene in uh, the early 2000s, I noticed very quickly that the, the standards that applied to a doctor changed drastically based on where they were being prosecuted and what circuit they were in. The Ninth Circuit was the most friendly. Uh, the Ninth Circuit typically gave an instruction that said um, uh, malpractice or reckless prescribing was not enough to be convicted. Uh, some other circuits were a little bit more difficult. The um, Eastern District of New York, for example, in the Quinones case, which wasn't that long ago, said that the phrase legitimate medical purpose had an objective meaning. And that objective meaning was really defined based on standards of practice in the medical community. Other defendants tried to say that the statute that was used was vague and didn't describe what a physician should be able to do. And, and all of those, of course, were misguided challenges because what essentially was happening was the Supreme Court was saying, no, this isn't vague. You just have to be practicing medicine. Everybody knows what medicine looks like. But the district courts were continuing to put up these tests for what was considered the legitimate practice of medicine. And so the district courts would try to get support from the Supreme Court and say, look, the Supreme Court says this isn't vague. But then as they continued to change what a physician was required to do, physicians kept saying, this looks vague to me because you keep changing the standard. And one thing about our system of laws is that nobody should be subjected to a shifting standard. That makes absolutely no sense. Well, let's fast forward to the only other time after more, the Supreme Court elected to take up the issue of lawful prescribing. And this, this one came up in a, a case that probably should be split off into a different episode because it has some very interesting complications and some very interesting discussion. And it's a very, very pivotal point in healthcare and in Supreme Court jurisprudence. We've got Gonzalez versus Oregon. Um, Gonzalez at the time was the attorney general. Alberto Gonzalez. Oregon is obviously a state. Oregon sued Gonzalez, the attorney general at the time, because the attorney general did something that was kind of unorthodox. Well, I should say Oregon probably started it. If you all recall in Detroit, and, and I actually had an opportunity to meet this man, um, I wasn't expecting it, but I was very, very young. It's a guy named Jack Kevorkian. He was the death with dignity guy. Um, he used to uh, allow people to commit assisted suicide. And he started by just giving them the ability to do it, but he wouldn't actually get involved. And then I think he was prosecuted because he was the one who was actually like pulling the trigger on the machine or allowing this machine to start working and setting it up in the homes of people. And he got this attorney, Jeffrey Figer, to defend him. And that was really Jeffrey Figer's claim to fame was defending Jack Kevorkian. He sort of came up in the legal world that way and then used that fame that he received to get involved in a, a Jenny Jones murder case, which is a whole other interesting case that we could talk about, and then eventually became a personal injury attorney and uh, has spent the rest of his time appearing on billboards and news ads and all of that, um, trying to get more car accident cases and whatnot. Um and, you know, of course, each town has them. I see the billboards. When I go to each new town, you get very familiar with who their big personal injury attorneys are. And Jeffrey Figer is one of the ones in Detroit. Of course, we've got the the, the glorious Jomana as well as Mike Morse. Those are probably the three, uh, the three top personal injury lawyers in the game. I, I digress a bit, but um, so this was around the time that was the, the late 90s, mid late 90s. Um, we started to see a bit of a movement here in assisted suicide. And um, Oregon decided to test the waters quite a bit. You know, they're in the Ninth Circuit is a little bit more friendly to these sorts of ideas. It gives a little bit more discretion. And this case went up to the Supreme Court in 2006. Oregon created something called the Death with Dignity Act. And the Death with Dignity Act essentially allowed assisted suicide in Oregon. And um, Alberto Gonzalez did not like that very much, uh, nor did President Bush at the time, and uh, attempted to modify, provide guidance to the Drug Enforcement Administration 
that issuing a prescription for the purposes of assisted suicide is not considered the practice of medicine. So the attorney general is saying this is not considered the practice of medicine. The Supreme Court for the first time was tasked with saying what is and what is not in federal purview, what cannot be argued by the federal government when we look at what constitutes the practice of medicine. So the case gets all the way up to the court and they they look very deeply into the Controlled Substances Act. If you are anyone involved in healthcare, I really recommend that you read this decision. I can give you a citation. It's 546 U.S. 243, came out in 2006. And they really go into the meaning and the purpose and the structure of the Controlled Substances Act. If you deal at all with this space, check the case out. I'm going to try to put it down there in the notes for you so that you can... Uh, so that you can see it and um, hopefully take a read if you're interested. The Supreme Court was pretty clear that the Controlled Substances Act was not designed to displace the states as the primary regulators of the medical profession or to override the state's determination as to what constitutes legitimate medical practice. There's only one area in which the Supreme Court determined the Controlled Substances Act is the national standard of medicine. Congress only gave authorization to the DEA in one area, and that's the treatment of narcotics addicts. That's SAMHSA. That's the use of methadone clinics and certain drugs that are designed to treat addiction. And the reason why they did that is because they wanted to actually help doctors who wanted to practice addiction medicine in avoiding regulatory scrutiny by taking over the field, providing specific guidance, and being very clear as to what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do. But there was no specific guidance concerning what is required to support a conclusion that a physician practiced outside the course of professional practice, which is the inquiry in all of these cases. The Supreme Court in 2006 in Gonzalez said, we really don't have any guidance for what is the accepted bounds of professional practice. We've really got to look at a broad case-by-case approach. But one thing's for sure. We can't let the attorney general, we can't let the government decide what is the practice of medicine. We must look at the states. Now, we have more that was supposed to be something that informed doctors about what the limits of their liability are. Be a doctor and you're going to be okay. Be a drug pusher and you're not going to be okay. That's as simple as it gets. And then we have Gonzalez saying, hey, government, it's not up to you to say what's the practice of medicine, what that be a doctor means. It's up to the states to define what the proper practice of medicine is. It's not up to the federal government. Why do we have CDC guidelines? Beats me. Read Gonzalez, CDC. You're not allowed to say that. The states get to decide. Now, the reason why the states get to decide this is something called the police power. And this is probably also going to be addressed in future episodes. I'll certainly talk about what that police power is. But the common contention that we learn in law school is that the federal government has no police power. The federal government is not designed, despite all of the things that they do, they are not designed to look after the general welfare of the population. The states are not in a position to handle disputes between the states and issues of federalism. But one thing they can do very well is decide what is necessary for the health, safety, and welfare of the people. That's how our system was supposed to operate. The states look after the people. The feds look after the states. We all live a happy life. Somewhere we got it twisted and the feds started looking out for the feds and the states started looking out for the people But because they had to do so much to comply with federal guidance, they really lost a voice and the ability to do that. But Gonzalez makes it pretty clear. It's a very, very important state's rights decision. We had Sandra Day O'Connor on the court, I believe. I think this was, oh, John Roberts may have been in already. uh, So this may not have been the Rehnquist court, but we still had Scalia there. We had some pretty prominent state's rights folks. And they interpreted the Controlled Substances Act in a way that it doesn't conflict with the state's lawful exercise of power. 
They went back to a textualist approach and they interpreted it in a way that could be enforced, which is Controlled Substances Act tells you what the limits of liability are for a physician, but the state tells you what is the practice of medicine. So when we look at the states and ask them what is the practice of medicine, nowadays, just about every state has their own requirements. The strange thing is, is despite the Gonzalez opinion, we don't have indications that federal courts are looking towards state guidance in order to determine whether or not a physician is practicing. One proposal I had is that in order to prosecute a physician for practicing outside the scope, we should have a referral from the state licensing authority that this departed so far from their practice act or what they require that there should be prosecution. States should be able to deal with what is the practice of medicine. I can't tell you how many cases I've defended where a physician was doing something that the state didn't even think was wrong, but the feds decided to go after him. That is absolutely wrong, especially if you read Gonzalez. So that's 2006. We move forward all the way to the CDC guidelines in 2016. And we've got the Supreme Court saying the states should determine what is the practice of medicine. And then because of the opiate epidemic, the CDC dives headfirst into territory that it was not authorized to get involved in based on a group that was uh, put together, physicians, to draft something that I think really furthered a lot of the aims of prosecutors and regulators, but didn't really help doctors understand their limits. In fact, it made it worse, made it messier. And it certainly was the tail wagging the dog when we look at states' rights. The CDC guidelines came out in 2016, and shortly after those guidelines came out, we started to see states interpret those guidelines and include them into their practice acts and misinterpret even the CDC guidelines in a way that they were never meant to, to, to be interpreted. We started seeing states put dosage limitations on what dosages could be prescribed by certain physicians, which is such a strange theory, and the CDC guidelines don't even call for it. We started to see um, some states um, uh, effectively discipline physicians for prescribing outside of those dosage limitations. We started to see uh, primary care physicians push patients into pain management, refusing to prescribe for the, the normal chronic pain that patients had, sending patients to pain management physicians. The only problem is nobody warned pre-2016 the AMA or medical schools that the demand on pain management physicians was going to be greater. So their practices swelled. And that's really where we see the case of, of good Dr. Hansen. And that's where I will start my discussion of Dr. Hansen's case. Dr. Hansen was an interventional pain physician who operated a practice called the IPS, Interventional Pain Specialists. He worked in Northern Kentucky. He ran a pretty successful practice uh, and, and he was open for, I think, 30 years by the time I got on the case and I started working with him. He had some incredibly talented staff and did a great job hiring folks in order to make sure that his patients could be taken care of. And this was a very powerful theme in closing argument to the jury. And he started relatively small. Now let's go back to the early 2000s. He had a few nurses. He did interventional procedures, not a ton of prescribing because he was an interventional guy. And for those who don't know what interventional pain management is, it's really using injections into the spine, epidurals, facet joint injections, um, sometimes steroids, sometimes other medications in order to provide some pain relief by you know, effectively shutting off that nerve that's causing the relief. The hope there is that a patient can restore some function, get some movement back 
If you've ever been a pain patient, I think you'll understand how well this could potentially work. You get some function back, you get moving, and then you start to live a, a little bit of a better life and you're not going to be, you know, resigned to a wheelchair or as one witness put it, you know, going from the car to the recliner every single day. That's not a life that an interventional pain physician wants for any of their patients. So Dr. Hansen used these techniques and he used them very effectively. He was known to be incredibly skilled with a needle and um, used something called a fluoroscopy machine in order to make sure that he hit the specific nerves on the spine and, um, you know, did a very good job doing it, but he didn't prescribe that much. He didn't have to. A primary care physician would write a referral. He would go to Dr. Hansen for some injections. The primary care physician would still prescribe pain medication for the patient until that was no longer needed because the injections started working. But primary care very much took care of the overall medical treatment of the patient, including using controlled substance prescriptions for the treatment. Well, that started to change in between 2008 and 2016, in that eight-year period. We started to see um, the pill mills of Southern Ohio uh, come into play. And, and while the feds weren't the first really to start targeting this, the states were. Ohio started cracking down on physicians and really started going after some of these pill mills. Um, if you read the book Dreamland, which is a very powerful discussion of what was happening in Portsmouth in this time. And I had cases in that area. Some of some of them were relatively egregious in terms of what was being prescribed. You have Dr. Volkman out there in 2014. He was prosecuted. Um, lots of pills, started his own pharmacy, patient deaths. Um, I wasn't involved in that case at all. But if you read the appellate court opinions, um, you know, I think the allegations were of a different sort of practice than what we would normally see today. And Ohio was very aggressive in going after doctors like Dr. Volkman. Uh, there was a physician, Dr. Proctor, who's sort of largely known to be the first person to engage in this um, pill mill type alleged activity. Now, the, the real question is, were these pill mills were these people who were, you know, greedy or were these compassionate physicians who were trying to deal with folks in these mountain towns or, you know, mining communities and all of the injuries that they had? Uh, that That's the real question. And that's really the rub between the government and the defense in almost all of these cases, the Volkman case, the Proctor case, all of that. But let's go back to Dr. Hansen. So he's out there in northern Kentucky, which is just right on the border there, Cincinnati, basically Ohio. And Ohio is cracking down on all these doctors and the states are starting to really tighten up on what should be prescribed. So in 2012, they pass a bill called House Bill 1. House Bill 1 contained specific restrictions on what could be prescribed to the citizens of Kentucky. And as a result of that, a lot of the primary care physicians started shifting their prescribing over to pain management physicians because of specifically what House Bill 1 told them to do, which was essentially seek that referral. Again, the problem is nobody informed the pain management physicians, the interventional pain management physicians, that this was coming. And Dr. Hansen wasn't just an office-based prescribing pain management physician. He was an interventional guy. He was like the anesthesiologist who shows up in your hospital room during labor and provides you that epidural shot. He was never intended to be the prescribing guy doing the office-based visit. That was not what he was designed for. In fact, that field of medicine, this office-based prescribing was normally handled by primary care physicians until the beginnings of the pain management physician, but usually they were really only applied in um, very specific cases dealing with cancer pain and different types of pain, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, I always am hesitant to say that medical term because I fear court reporters having to type it out each and every time. That's just a, a byproduct of the, the job here. But, you know, pain management physicians weren't supposed to be used as primary care doctors prescribing chronic pain management. They were designed to look into specific areas of pain and try to treat that and then release the patient with chronic pain back to the primary care who's supposed to take care of them. But the legislature had a different idea. And so they create these sort of regulations. 
The CDC then comes along four years later, 2016, and issues their CDC guidelines. If you're not familiar with, with those, I think the only thing you need to know is that shortly after those guidelines came out, the American Medical Association basically issued a warning. The New England Medical Journal did as well, saying that these guidelines are misapplied and have, has caused harm. Health and Human Services later came out and said there was patient stigma as a result of these guidelines. These guidelines were the biggest misstep in healthcare since meaningful use, and that's saying something and caused significant harm on the medical community and had essentially a disastrous, disastrous impact on pain patients. It also had a disastrous impact on doctors. We start to see the statistical race to the bottom. Most physicians who are primary care um, were starting to get judged by how many pain patients they had. And if you had more than your, your peers, you were a drug pusher and they would go after you. Uh, most pain physicians were starting to be judged based on their patient population, and they were given some of the most difficult patients to take care of, and as a result, had some very difficult decisions to make as to whether or not to keep a patient on pain management if they were struggling with addiction or if they you know, weren't significantly improving. They had to make some calls, some judgment calls uh, related to compassion and whatnot. That was difficult for doctors. It was difficult for a doctor like Dr. Hansen because he started out doing interventional work. He realized that these patients were getting pushed over onto him and that if he released the patients back to their primary care, they wouldn't get adequate pain treatment. And so he would have to take over the prescribing. This was the trial testimony. Take over the prescribing or the patient would only get interventional treatments. Now, what happens to a patient who really needs some longstanding pain medication but is only allowed to get injections? Here's what happens. The injections take a while to work. In some instances, you have to go through a course of treatment, diagnostic, and then a full procedure. During that time, the patient will be in debilitating pain. Um, and then also, even once those start to work, they don't handle the pain in the entire body. And so other pain conditions may prevent that patient from getting moving again. You can really only do a certain number of levels at a time of the spine. And if a pain patient is like most patients and has an issue in multiple areas, they don't really have that pain medication helping them get back on their feet and functioning. They really have to kind of deal with their pain condition until there's some change. And so that's, that was the concern that Dr. Hansen had. And so he elected to take over prescribing for compassionate reasons. And so he does that for a number of years without issue, without medical board complaint, without anybody looking at him sideways, really without any medical malpractice issue. And then along comes a guy named Eric Dieters. Eric Dieters is a personal injury attorney who operates in um, Ohio, as well as uh, Northern Kentucky there. Um, famously, he was um, disciplined by the bar as a lawyer, ultimately disbarred for threatening to burn down a courthouse. He'd been jailed several times, uh, once for contempt, another one for, I think, a charge of uh, menacing. Um, he uh, He's just really well known in the area for being the kind of muckraker, uh, personal injury attorney that just takes everything way too far. He was involved in a case related to a guy named Dr. Durrani. Dr. Durrani was a spinal surgeon who operated in that area. Um, Eric Dieters uh, found a, a pretty solid meal ticket in Durrani cases by arguing that Dr. Durrani was the um, a doctor who was doing unnecessary procedures. I think they called him like the butcher of Pakistan. And, and Dieters tried to come out with a documentary to promote some of his theories about what Durrani did. And I don't know Durrani. I don't know the patients. I don't know the treatment. I'm not taking a stance on that. But what I will tell you is that Durrani then fled the country for whatever reason. And um, a very prominent, I believe, Ohio Court of Appeals ruling came down determining that um, many of Dieter's cases were outside of the statute of limitations, effectively robbing Dieter's of what he thought was going to be his longstanding meal ticket. This is probably what resulted in a lot of his outlandish behavior. Some of it was already occurring even before then, but needless to say, uh, no Durrani um, cases landed. I mean, there may, there may have been a couple that he recovered some from, but it certainly wasn't a retirement kind of money he was hoping for. So 
he looked for his next target. Now, during that um, case, you know, he worked with law enforcement on trying to target Durrani. And I think Durrani was ultimately targeted for prosecution. And he thought, maybe I'll repeat the same thing in this case. And so he works with law enforcement and he finds a new target. He finds a new target in Kendall Hansen. And um, I think it was 2012, Dr. Hansen had a horse in the Kentucky Derby. And when you have a horse in the Kentucky Derby and, you know, the breeding operation as a result of that takes hold, uh, a lot of people think you, you have a lot of money. You're very collectible. You become the next target of a personal injury attorney. And so uh, Eric Dieters decided to grab as many cases as he could related to Dr. Hansen um, by going out and kind of stumping for, for people, arguing that he, uh, Dr. Hansen was somehow a butcher and was doing unnecessary procedures on uh, patients. He filed a number of lawsuits. Uh, some of them um, reportedly were filed without even consent of the patients who he was filing on behalf of. Again, we have an unethical guy doing unethical things, and he was doing it in this case as well. And well, he'd known law enforcement from the, the former Durrani case, and he wanted to leverage that. And so um, it seems as if there was some collaboration between law enforcement and Eric Dieters, which is great for Dieters because if the federal government can do his job for him and ratchet up PR against Dr. Hansen, it plays right into his hand. And he's got his new batch of cases this time against somebody who's not likely to run. Dr. Hansen isn't a foreign guy. And that's the, that's the difference. He wanted somebody with deep pockets who wasn't foreign, who wasn't going to run. So he targets Dr. Hansen. Fast forward to the trial. Eric Dieters posted a uh, investigator in the back of the courtroom and decided to go on his YouTube channel and discuss the case. Uh, over and over again, he misrepresented what happened in the courtroom while witnesses were being crossed and a resounding victory was starting to develop against the government, Eric Dieters was going in the media every night, trying to make it sound like Dr. Hansen was ultimately going to be convicted. Uh, and of course, his final show um, suggested that Dr. Hansen was somehow like OJ Simpson, who got off with murder. He, he still couldn't shut his mouth even after the jury came back with a uh, acquittal for for Dr. Hansen, despite the fact that his investigator was watching the whole thing play out each and every day in the courtroom. And he should have been well aware that the government's case just didn't have the legs. So we've got Dieter's lawsuits. We've got the Department of Justice sniffing around. 2019, Dr. Hansen's practice gets raided. Now, this isn't just any practice. This is a large practice. Dr. Hansen had seven C-arm machines. These cost over $100,000 apiece. He had physicians there who were educated at Harvard, the Mayo Clinic, came from the Cleveland Clinic. He had physicians who were board certified in interventional anesthesiology as well as other prof professions. Some doctors in, in varying you know, stages of their practice. One of them who uh, went on to be a member of the Kentucky Medical Board. Somebody who was on the medical board worked for the practice. Another employee, a nurse, was actually the coroner for the county that the practice resided in. This was not just some run-of-the-mill, you know, clinic that opened up. This was a place with employees who'd been there for 20 years, sometimes more. One employee worked for Dr. Hansen for almost 30 years. Other employees, 10, 12, 15 years. Now you show me an employer who has employees who stick around that long. And, you know, generally speaking, not only do they compensate their employees well, but they create a nice working environment. They create a family environment loyal people who care about the practice. And that's exactly what Dr. Hansen had going for him here. And so in 2019, he gets raided and a lot of these people get interviewed and the case moves forward. Um, not too much to talk about until we get to the first day of trial, which started just over a month ago. I was Dr. Hansen's counsel accompanied by my investigator, Mike Staples, and we prepared our case um, as best as we could prior to getting into trial. And we were interested in seeing how the government's witnesses would shake out. So here's the case. The government decided, because they couldn't really make a case out of the patients that Dr. Hansen 
had and the treatment that they were receiving, what they decided to do, and when I say they couldn't make a case out of the patients, what I really mean is they really couldn't get patient witnesses to testify against Dr. Hansen because his patients loved him. So what they decided to do was go through death records and try to look to see if anybody in the past had died as a result of opiates and were a patient of Dr. Hansen's or other doctors who were at the practice. The idea was that if patients died with opiates in their system, the argument could easily be made that Dr. Hansen should have known that his medications were causing death and should have stopped his prescribing or done some sort of investigation. Um, this was something where the dots weren't completely connected. The government's expert, Dr. Timothy King, took the stand and argued that there's something called a sentinel event, which is death of a patient. Unfortunately, Dr. King was misrepresenting uh, what the guidance really says. Um, sentinel events are sort of hospital events that apply to 24-hour round-the-clock type facilities. And those don't actually require you to investigate a patient death. What they require you to do is investigate a death of somebody who occurred at the location, uh, a suicide of somebody within 24 hours of them being at the location, uh, falls and other things that happen at a hospital should be investigated. Those are sentinel events. The death of a patient at some point after an appointment is never considered a sentinel event because doctors don't have the ability to investigate the personal lives of their patients. They just simply don't. And so the government tried to make this strange argument that because people died, Dr. Hansen should have investigated it. But the thing they forgot about was actually proving causation, a relationship between the medications that were prescribed and the deaths. I'm not going to give patient names here. I respect the families of these patients. Uh, ultimately, they were patients of Dr. Hansen's and were receiving medical care. And, you know, while this was a public trial and I easily could talk about any of them and provide their names, I'm not going to just out of respect for the families, but I'll give you some of the stories that were just so strange with respect to the lack of government investigation, there was one patient received an injection from another doctor at Dr. Hansen's practice, got in the car, went to the pharmacy to fill the medication, never took the medication, fell asleep on the ride home. When they got near the house, somebody tried to wake the patient up. The patient was deceased. No autopsy, no scene investigation. No investigation whatsoever. The government tries to make the case that because this patient passed away and because they had just come from the clinic, the death must have been caused by the prescription of opiates. The one thing they forgot to look into was whether or not the prescription was actually filled and ingested by the patient. An autopsy didn't determine whether or not that particular medication was ingested, but a family member later testified that that medication wasn't ingested. And of course, with no autopsy, we can't tell. And I would later cross-examine Dr. Ralston about this. We couldn't tell whether this death was related to any of the major causes of death in the United States or opiates. Was it an aneurysm? Was it heart failure? Was it a combination of another medication? Was it an issue with the injection procedure that occurred? Was it some other medication the patient was taking? You know, without an autopsy and drug tests of all these different types of things, we can't really start going around saying we know who did it and we know it was the doctor just because of proximity, just because of the amount of time that passed between the appointment and the death of the patient. It was another patient died in her home. And, um, we heard testimony from a family member of the patient that the patient was up and talking at three o'clock in the morning and took some nerve medication that was filled the day before. That medication was not prescribed by Dr. Hansen and that this patient didn't have any medication prescribed by Dr. Hansen in the home. The patient passed away. I don't recall an autopsy on that case either. And the government suggested that Dr. Hansen should have known that that death was problematic. Now, I don't know of many doctors who have patients who've never died. 
I can tell you that Dr. Hansen has had patients that pass away. Every single doctor in the United States has. This is not something that should be considered strange in the practice of medicine. Patients who have complex health histories that include pain are more at risk of some sort of adverse outcome of something. More likely to die than probably most other patients that are being seen. And Dr. Hansen isn't their primary care physician, so we don't know what issues are going on with her heart or things like that. There were, within these 13 deceased patients, there were so many other examples. One of them, medical examiner determined that it was heart failure and the patient should have died as a result of that. And um, Dr. Ralston on the stand said, I don't agree with that. I'm going to go with uh, opiate death. Overrode the decision of what I would later say in closing, uh, the decision of the person who actually had their hands in the body looking at the heart, determining it was heart failure. Dr. Ralston, while only looking at a report, made his own determination. And so this was a strange theory pursued by the government without sufficient investigation, and it was a pivot from their original theory that Dr. Hansen was some sort of a drug pusher who was just using drugs to get his patients into the door to perform expensive injections. That theory just did not pan out at all in the case. Opening argument or opening statement in the case was um, about 15 minutes by the government. I went for about an hour describing what this type of medical treatment looks like, what injections are for, the charges, and uh, some of the issues with causation. And, you know, I try to set the tone with the jury early that I'm going to teach them uh, what healthcare looks like in this capacity. Uh, the government put on a couple of employees that were kind of easily dismissed because they later accepted more money to work for competitors and they were currently working for a competitor of Dr. Hansen's practice. And so it could seem that they were being a little bit gatekeepy in terms of the pain management field in that area. Uh, and it came time for the government's expert, Dr. Timothy King, and this will be the subject of a separate piece later on on expert testimony. But it was appalling the stretches that Dr. King would try to make uh, in arguing really arguing. He wasn't being an expert. He was arguing that Dr. Hansen's treatment was um, illegitimate and unjustified. Uh, Dr. King um, created his own standard, which he later tried to get a patent issued for. That patent said that there's no objective way you can determine if a physician is overprescribing. And when I challenged him with that phrase that he used, no objective way, he backed up and he said, no, the lawyers wrote that. I didn't write this when looking at the patent application. If any attorneys out there are listening and you're about to take on Dr. King for cross-examination, I will buy you lunch just to sit down with you and chat with you uh, about what I know about this man to give you the opportunity to have a full-throated cross-examination of somebody who I believe is really damaging to the practice of medicine. So feel free to reach out. I will give you everything, transcripts, chapter and verse, whatever you need. Um, well, for the second trial in a row of mine, Dr. King's testimony was rejected and soundly. Uh, nobody believes his standard. Uh, there's no support for it. When you challenge him on the articles, he tries to claim that they don't apply or that you're taking them out of context. And the legal wrangling that he tries to go through in order to uh, take the jury off of the scent of the fact that his tests and standards are really made up only in his own mind, uh, it's just astounding the stretches he has to make. In one instance, he got caught claiming that 40 morphine milligram equivalents, that's a way that we measure opiates. The CDC guidelines talk about this as well. He claimed that was a high dose of medication. Um, I'm going to wait because some of you are probably laughing right now if you know what morphine milligrams are. And if you were actually to know what the ACIP guidelines say, the guidelines that Dr. King should have been applying in his own practice because he's an interventional pain physician, you'd realize 40 morphine milligram equivalents according to chapter and verse ACIP guidelines is not a high dose. In fact, it's a low dose. When you confront King with that text, he says, well, it's on the higher end of low. And that's why I said that. The higher end of low. That sums King up in a nutshell. When specifically challenged, he will pivot to save even a modicum of face 
by saying ridiculous things like the higher end of low means high. Let that sit for a second. The case progressed with the testimony of Dr. Rolston. I've talked about that a bit, but at the end of the day, I think we knew what Rolston's issues were. He's got a couple thousand autopsies to do. He's only got 12 people to do them. He's got budget constraints and making a federal case out of every death is probably not something that they have been asked to do and something they don't have the budget for. And so the idea of going back and dragging up old death cases where there weren't autopsies and there wasn't a sufficient investigation to try to make it look like there's enough evidence for a criminal case, is just never going to work. Um, for those federal investigators who may be listening to this podcast, I'll tell you, if you think you can go backwards into a death and investigate it after the autopsy has been done or not done, after the toxicology has been done or not done, after um, the examination of the scene has been done or not done, you're going to be left with, with what was done or not done. And that's all the evidence you have. And it does not take very much for a defense attorney to... Um, poke holes in it. That is the single reason why uh, I have never had a client who has lost a death count, we call them, a count of prescribing opiates that has led to the death of a patient. Not a single one in my career has ever landed against a client that I have. And the reason why is because when coroners and when medical examiners investigate deaths, they do it in a much different way than when cops and forensic pathologists sometimes medical examiners, but doing it forensically for the purposes of evidence, they do things completely differently. So when we have a crime that is committed and we have a forensic autopsy conducted, the evidence that's going to come from that is much better. When we have a crime that's committed and we have a scene investigation and evidence collected and preserved, the investigation is going to be much better. But when we have a routine death in a home we're not going to have the sort of scene preservation. It's very difficult for a prosecutor to move forward and win a case like that unless they were able to investigate the case thoroughly just by happenstance. And so Dr. Rolson's testimony didn't res resonate that well with the jury. Came time for our case in chief. It took the government about three weeks, almost three weeks to put on everything that I talked about. And during our case, we rattled through it pretty quickly. A couple of reasons. I think that you don't need to belabor the point too much when it comes to the jury. I think being brief and efficient respects the jury's time. And if you can show them more faces in a relatively brief time period, I think that they will get to understand that you have support for your case, that you're keeping it moving for the jury, that you're keeping it interesting for the jury. And when they see the outpouring support for a single human being, they start to get the picture that there must be some qualities about this person that are redeeming. And they see enough faces and they see enough experience and they see enough personal accounts about that person. They start to get the idea that maybe any preconceived notions they had about them during initial jury selection, maybe some bad thoughts they had when they were listening to the testimony early on maybe some belief in the narrative the government may have presented that they heard during the uh, government's case in chief, some of that stuff starts to wash away. And it starts to wash away when you see real human beings who are able to be open and have a conversation on the witness stand, as opposed to the taut, stretched, pulled testimony of informants and people with immunity and those sorts of things. It's just very hard stuff to put on the stand and it doesn't look that credible. So when we put our witnesses on, I ask very open-ended questions. I ask them to tell their story. I follow up on details of that story to try to get granular with the type of evidence that's put on. I call patients for a specific purpose. I call employees for a specific purpose and I make sure the jury knows that purpose when I'm calling them. This nurse did intake. This is the person who's going to talk about what we do during intake. This person ran the front desk. This person was a provider at the practice. I'm going to use this person to talk about the medical record system and how the document is put together. We had different witnesses for different purposes. And that was the beauty of Dr. Hansen's practice is he gave me all of those elements by being a good boss and an employer for years and years and years. I had no shortage of people to reach to. 
to teach this jury about this practice and the people that worked at it. And each and every one of them got on the witness stand. I thank them greatly. It is not convenient. It is a difficult thing to do. And I'm thankful that given the choice between remaining silent or avoiding the process and coming forward to tell the truth about another human being, I'm thankful that they decided to come forward and tell the truth. And many of them told amazing truths about Dr. Hansen and his practice. We called a number of patients as well. And that was a pivotal moment in the case. Uh, there was one patient who, before seeing Dr. Hansen, was in and out of ERs with significant pain. Somebody Dr. King would have called a doctor shopper and denied them treatment. Well, when you put a guy like Dr. King on the stand, the, the worst thing that could happen to your case if you're the government is real patients who exhibited the qualities that Dr. King found were evil and those of a drug seeker. When those people get on the witness stand and they tell the jury their stories, their tales about their struggles in life, even if somebody struggled with addiction, you'll start to quickly see that those people sometimes do very well with a second chance as long as they're closely monitored. But the other tales of the types of people King would have rejected are tales of parents who were able to help their kids more and raise them better. Um, providers of families who were able to get to work and provide for their family. Um, an attorney took the stand to testify about how Dr. Hansen helped him uh, practice, helped a lot of his clients, and um, they had a wonderful relationship. And then there was a chiropractor who testified to treating a thousand patients alongside Dr. Hansen and having a lot of respect for his compassion, his ability to treat patients, and his love of the practice. All in all, by the time it was done, I think we probably called something like 17 or 18 witnesses in the span of two and a half days. The final witness was Dr. Murphy, our expert witness. He's a physician uh, who testifies in these sorts of cases regularly, regularly. And the reason why he does is because he has a passion for pain management, for addiction medicine, for the medical community in Kentucky. And he got on the witness stand and provided uh, his view of what is considered the legitimate practice of medicine in order to comply with uh, the standards in this type of case. And so all in all, a jury goes back to deliberate, always a very nervous thing to go through. Um, I have tried many, many cases, and I have never, no matter how well I think I've done, never entered deliberations thinking I had it in the bag. Juries are different everywhere you go. People are different everywhere you go. And the tiniest fact that you may not have seen coming could be pivotal in a case and the first thing on a jury's mind. Uh, the only thing I know about juries is that I know nothing about juries. And anybody who pretends otherwise is probably fooling themselves or maybe trying to sell you something like jury consultant services. The only thing I care about with respect to a jury is do we have people who are unbiased or the least amount of bias as we possibly can? Are they a fair cross-section of society? Not, are they a cross-section of society that cares more about my case? I just need a fair cross-section. And I want to know what they're coming to the table with education-wise so that I know what I have to explain. Do I have a jury that knows medical stuff? Do I have a jury full of engineers and professionals? Do I have a jury that may relate a little bit better towards discussion of, you know, some more blue collar working concepts. Um, most juries are a smattering of all those things, but you need to know who's on your jury so that you can cover down on the different types of learning, the different personalities, the different ways the case may be approached by those folks. And that's really what background helps me understand. It helps me as a teacher to know my class and where they're coming from and what their prior education and experience in life looked like. That's really all I need to know. And I will package up my case as a teacher because people believe people more when you teach them the information instead of telling them what to believe. I have this common thing I will tell all of my clients. I need facts, not arguments. There's only one point in a trial where you argue. That's the end closing arguments. And even then it should be 99% fact, 1% argument. People don't believe arguments. People are even more immune to arguments these days than they were before. Everything is an argument. It's an advertisement. It's a news headline. 
People like facts. People like to be taught. People like information. And if your information time and time again is more credible than anybody else, they will believe you. And you don't need to argue to them. You can just give them the facts and they will digest it. That's the relationship I want with my jury. That's what every attorney should be looking for. And at the end of the day, 12 people voted that we were more credible than the other side. And um, I think about two and a half days later, we received a acquittal uh, for Dr. Hansen on the counts of conspiracy to unlawfully distribute uh, to patients uh, on some substantive drug counts, which when we say that, we mean drug counts related to specific patients whose names I won't mention. Um, there were these two other charges that related to uh, allegations of him uh, receiving drugs or medications from employees um, that the jury ultimately hung on those two counts. And we are currently awaiting uh, some sort of decision on what might happen uh, with respect to that. But I, I will not um, and I did not make any comment in this podcast or in any other area related to the fact pattern of of those charges, because that would still be considered a pending legal matter before the court. Um, that being said, um, with respect to the allegations that Dr. Hansen unlawfully prescribed to his patients, uh, he was soundly acquitted by a jury, and that is the end of the justice process for him. Um, he got a fair trial in front of a, uh, a judge who was very knowledgeable in the law and a court staff who was very efficient and a joy to try a case with. And um, I'm really appreciative for the opportunity to have represented Dr. Hansen yet another physician who was being charged with this sort of thing. And I'm very happy for what it says to the pain management community, as well as to the Department of Justice about the selection of for future cases going forward. And I hope at the end of the day, there will be some lessons learned about the utilization of witnesses like Dr. King and the types of standards that they bring to the table and whether or not that stuff will be believed by future juries. I think the message has been very clear that it will not. And so... The tide is turning out of the last six cases I've tried. I think we've had a seven last seven cases. I've tried five full acquittals. One of them was a mixed bag, some acquittals, some convictions, uh, some difficult facts. And then one of them was a, um, a clinic that uh, is still an open case that I'm not really at liberty to talk about here. But I think that the point here is that uh, because the prosecution in these types of cases are taking closer and closer calls to court, to federal criminal courts, questions of really malpractice even, to federal criminal courts, we're seeing the juries push back a bit on the government. And that trend is, I think, enlightening. Uh, it should be for the government. The problem is, and this is something that I imagine most prosecutors will silently agree with, but probably not vocally agree with, when it comes to the selection of cases by the Department of Justice, those cases aren't really selected by a United States attorney who is listening to investigators. Uh, those cases are really uh, selected a bit more by the Department of Justice and more of a bureaucratic process and wheels get put in motion early that are very difficult to stop. And if there's one thing I wish that we could change about our system of justice, that is to allow easier off ramps to uh, ceasing a prosecution once it's gotten started. The reality is, is that once agents spend years investigating a case, they're married to it. It's hard for them to put a stop to it. Once the federal government has spent a whole bunch of resources and assistant United States attorneys have gone to bat for the existence of this prosecution to their superiors, they've put their credibility on the line for a case like this. It's very hard for them to pull the plug. It's very hard for minds to be changed. And if it was just easier in our society and in these cases as a whole to change your mind, to say, no, we're going to follow a different path because we think this is what's right. We have new information and that is relevant. Then we would see a lot more of these cases be resolved based on common sense as opposed to going through the arduous process. That process is something that can strip a man's dignity away, a person's dignity away. 
years and years of battling the costs of a legal defense, getting witnesses, family and friends to potentially testify, colleagues, the investigation that needs to happen, federal government peering into every aspect of your life, charts and graphs showing your income and everything you've done displayed publicly before a jury. These are all very difficult things for people to go through. And if we could just have some common sense applied to this process early on so that not everybody had to go through that, I think it, the system would be better for it. We'd be making better decisions related to prosecuting. Now, that's not to say that every prosecutor who goes forward to trial and loses a case has made an unethical choice about who to prosecute. That's certainly not the case at all. Um, some cases can be won on technicalities. Sometimes the jury has a tough decision to make and they just decide to err on reasonable doubt. That's certainly possible. That happens in a lot of cases. But something's different about these opiate cases. We don't see the types of things we would normally see in an investigation. These days, we're not seeing as many undercover visits. We're not seeing experts, credible experts being employed early on in the process. We're seeing the tail wagging the dog. We're seeing data and statistics being used in the place of actual cold, hard investigation. And so I think really the question is, has the case been sufficiently investigated and enough facts determined to show that the physician is acting outside the usual course of professional practice? That must be shown. And I think one bellwether sign would be a successful case by the licensing board prior to the initiation of federal action. That would be a change that I think would be vital. Of course, it's one that will never be accepted by the federal government because they don't want the state mucking around in their case before they get a chance. They like to investigate and move in secret for various reasons. And when I was a prosecutor, I preferred to have that ability too. But with healthcare cases, where the decision to issue a search warrant against a practice has such dire consequences, the loss of employment, the loss of a treating physician for 3,000 pain patients in Dr. Hansen's case, the impact that that has and the stigma that that raid creates on the patient file of any patient who is there. I've seen the Department of Justice, even in this case, openly attempt to declare in court that physicians coming from other practices who'd faced similar measures were somehow tainted, dirty patients. Well, that certainly isn't true for Dr. Hansen's patients, or at least that's not true if you ask 12 members of the federal jury in Covington, Kentucky. And so the automatic assumption by a prosecutor that just because a physician faced scrutiny, that physician's patients are doing something wrong. Well, that's just not going to age well. And that's not how our system of justice should be making decisions. Thanks for joining me for this longer episode of DeNovo. Now we're getting to a case that's a little bit more personal, not something I initially planned on doing, but you know, I think it's valuable for us to understand how the laws shifted going to the 19th and 20th centuries and how today those laws are used to prosecute certain practices. And I think it's important to look at at least a little bit the anatomy of a case against a physician and how physicians can prevail against some of these attitudes and beliefs about pain management and some of the expert opinions that we've seen. I use that word in quotations and I think it's important to see the impact on pain patients when doctors like this are prosecuted. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit a review. Hopefully you give me those five stars. If you have any questions, just jump on to ronaldwchapman.com and fill out the uh, contact box. I'm happy to get back to you and answer any questions you have about this. If you're a pain patient seeking support, there's a lot of support groups out there. I could recommend the Doctor Patient Forum, Claudia Morendi. If you're a physician looking for some support because you're going through this process as well, happy to chat with you and give you some pointers and tips on how some of my clients have been able to navigate this process well. And if you're 
somebody who's not involved in the healthcare industry and you're just somebody who's interested in good old Supreme Court decisions and federal law and how it's prosecuted, I really thank you for uh, your attention and your time. And I hope you enjoy the future, future episodes coming up. I think in the hopper, we've got something related to the First Amendment and Larry Flint. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the Hamdan case and the terror courts that were created as a result of the global war on terror. That includes some in Guantanamo Bay, uh, an issue near and dear to my heart because previously I was in the Marine Corps and was involved in detainee operations and legal justification for detention. So I look forward to spending some time with you all teaching you about that aspect of the law and some very interesting stuff that has come out as a result of it. Uh, but until next time, take care. And uh, as my good friend Sean Weiss says, um, I think he says, be good to yourselves and be good to each other. As always, you can find me over at my website, ronaldwchapman.com. There you can find articles related to all of this, notes, cases, additional reading and information, and even a few videos, ronaldwchapman.com. Find me over there.